Sarbrick Peel is generally looked at as the founder of democratic policing, something that I very much want to see occur, uh, and was known for his, if you like, experiment in creating a, a, a democratic policing force that would be consistent with democratic values. But another reason I'm honored to get this award today at, uh, here at Cambridge uh, is the MSD program itself, because uh, I think that this program represents another fundamental experiment in policing, this time uh, around the idea of evidence, and Larry and Peter and Heather and Barack and others that I'm not mentioning uh, are uh, key to this process. I was thinking that, um, that I, I, I at least read that, uh, that after Peel established the Metropolitan Police, before they were called Bobbies, they were called Peelers. So I was thinking maybe we should call this the Cambridgers all over the world who are advancing evidence-based policy. So anyway, thank you very much, Larry, and uh, everyone here. And uh, it's really, uh, for me, uh, this is a, a very nice honor. So I'm gonna tell you about an experiment uh, that we recently published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. I'll mention that at the outset. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the, uh, the citation. It's open access. The article's short. That's what they require. There are like 80 pages of appendices for people that want to actually know some of the more potent details. Um, we, we, the, the title of the paper is uh, Changing Police Encounters Through Procedural Justice Training, a Multi-City Randomized Trial at Crime Hotspots. Um, a project like this is, uh, uh, it's a multi-city project, a randomized trial with lots of uh, elements to it, uh, and it involves a, a, a large team, as, as Larry mentioned. I'll just note at the outset, uh, there's uh, myself from George Mason University and from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, uh, Cody Telb from Arizona State University, uh, a PhD student of mine at Mason's, Heather Vovic, Vovac from uh, the National Police Institute, formerly uh, the National Police Foundation, um, now at the Washington, D.C. Police, Taryn Zastro from George Mason, Anthony Braga, another student of mine from Rutgers, I should note, uh, 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 who's now at the University of Pennsylvania, where John will be speaking tomorrow, um, John McDonald, and uh, Brandon uh, Turchin. It's also the case that a project like this demanded a great deal of funding, so I want to note right at the outset the Arnold Foundation, who provided uh, by uh, our standards a, a really tremendous, by any standard, a tremendous amount of research support to collect all the different pieces of data uh, in this study. I also want to note the National Policing Institute provider is sort of the glue for all of us in terms of working with these police agencies that I'll talk about in a few minutes. So the question becomes, why did we design an experiment uh, on procedural justice in hotspots? And, and really, there are, there are two main reasons. The first surrounds the issue of hotspots policing itself. Uh, there's strong evidence that hotspots policing uh, is effective, that it can reduce crime uh, without displacement crime to nearby areas. Indeed, uh, I wrote an article called, Does Crime Just Move Around the Corner? Uh, that was a phrase taken from a police officer in one of the hotspots experiments. Uh, which we found that it didn't, you're more likely to get a diffusion of crime control benefits, and that's the conclusions of a Campbell collaboration review that Anthony Braga led. But uh, to get a sense of what we're talking about, uh, the original reviews for hotspots used uh, um, statistical approaches that actually weren't that uh, appropriate for place-based studies, and Anthony Braga and I went back and analyzed uh, about 60 tests for hotspots policing that were quasi-experimental and uh, randomized experiments and found that uh, on average, uh, there's a, it's statistically significant, but on average a 16% crime decline. So on average across all these studies, you get a, about a 16% crime decline from hotspots policing. While the evidence for hotspots policing is extremely strong, the 2004 National Academy of Sciences report, the 2018 proactive policing report of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, uh, both say that the evidence base for hotspots policing is very strong, indeed I think probably the strongest of any policing strategy, but a number of people have raised questions about, well, does this policing strategy lead to negative outcomes in the community? 
And I should note, there's not an, a lot of evidence of this, but the logic model is strong in the sense that if you bring a lot of police to a, pl uh, to a specific place and they're using law enforcement activities, uh, you might expect for there to be some backfire effects in terms of community sentiment and orientations. So uh, uh, when I first started thinking of doing this experiment, I said, well, we want to, uh, what we really need to do is to show, or at least to look at how we can uh, uh, maximize in hotspots policing not only crime prevention benefits, but also uh, minimize uh, 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 possible negative effects in the community. So that brought me to procedural justice, which has been seen as an as a important reform effort to do something to improve community attitudes towards the police. Now, uh, um, I, I should note that the, uh, the, the, the fact is that though, uh, for example, the uh, the report of the Obama administration on 21st century policing concluded that procedural justice should be one of the pillars of, uh, of modern policing. Uh, uh, the fact is that uh, uh, at least when the National Academy of Sciences uh, uh, Committee on Proactive Policing uh, reviewed the evidence, uh, they didn't come to the con that conclusion. With the conclusion of that panel, and I should note that I was the chair of that committee, just to be transparent from the outset. Uh, but also sitting on the committee, by the way, and it's a consensus report, were Tracy Mirrors and Tom Tyler, who are sort of the theoretical and empirical uh, 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 base of the procedural justice idea. But anyway, the proactive policing report concluded that the evidence wasn't strong enough to, to find either that the, there was an impact of procedural justice on uh, community sentiment or on uh, crime. Uh, Tom Tyler argues that if you can increase community trust, you can also have a impact in crime. So that was our conclusions. I should note there's better evidence, if you like, for example, in uh, 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 the Maserol review uh, um, on uh, Campbell review on procedural justice of individual effects. In other words, if we treat people better, they will be uh, they will see the police as more legitimate. But the evidence on community impacts was uh, weak. We concluded there wasn't enough evidence. Not enough evidence, by the way, doesn't mean something work, doesn't work. And so therefore, I, in my mind, I said, well, wait a minute, maybe this is like uh, what we found in hotspots policing. That it's not that police patrol does not have an impact in crime. It's just you can't just spread peace, uh, police patrol around. You want to concentrate patrol. And if you concentrate patrol, and this was Larry and my original insight in the Minneapolis hotspots experiment, you'll get, a, 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 you'll get a crime prevention benefit, and we did observe that. So now I ask, well, these hotspots are places where there's a lot of interaction with the public. Some of that interaction, or a lot of it probably, is involves some law enforcement activities. So maybe we ought to look specifically at these places. So those were the two uh, uh, research ideas that informed uh, uh, doing this study. Uh, the first was, if we infuse um, hotspots hot policing with procedural justice training, uh, will we reduce potential negative effects of hotspots policing in the community? And the second was, if we use procedural justice at crime hotspots, where citizens are most likely to interact with the police, uh, uh, often in, uh, in situations that might be tense, uh, would that allow for us to see the effects of procedural justice on community evaluations and on crime? Now there was something else in the background when we were carrying out this study that was happening in part because, as already mentioned in some of the talks this morning, uh, 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 the Floyd situation in the U.S. and other examples of police abuse and problematic behavior uh, has led to uh, 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 strong concerns about the police. And uh, uh, interesting enough, there are sort of two competing narratives at the moment uh, about policing, at least in the U.S., uh, that I think are very important this study speaks to. And one narrative is that uh, Floyd, other examples like that, mean that we have to pay attention to reform. Reform has to be the number one issue. And if we're going to pay attention to reform, it means we have to withdraw at least a, in part from police effectiveness. So, so that's the sort of the extreme of that is the defund the police movement. But many people just argue we have to focus on reform now. We can't put as much focus on effectiveness. Now, uh, it's interesting to me, coming back to the U.S. Uh, this summer, that there's a, a, now a, 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 a large, a, an argument that's growing stronger than the sort of uh, we have to focus on reform our argument, 
And that is the argument we have to focus on crime control because uh, violence in the U.S. has gone up a, a great deal, especially last year, this year less, but for the first time in many, many years, we're seeing very large uh, increases in violence in the U.S., especially in larger cities. And this has led to the other side of the argument, which is, well, we have to partially withdraw from reform, no matter how important it might be, we have to be focused on effectiveness because that's the situation. So this, this argument between reform and public safety, as if they were competing arguments, is very much out there. And, and this study, as you'll see, uh, presents a, a different view, which is, uh, not that they're competing arguments but uh, uh, approaches, but indeed that they may reinforce each other, and I think that's an important lesson uh, for policing. Okay, the study overview. Um, this was a three-city randomized trial. In medicine, there are many multi-city randomized trial. In criminology, relatively few. It's important because any city might have special characteristics. When you work across cities, you're uh, you're at least trying to minimize uh, uh, the effects of that sort of bias. Uh, the initial city was Tucson, Arizona, uh, which we started in 2017, 2018. And one of the reasons why there's this space in time is the Arnold Foundation, which was investing over $2 million in this project, they said, well, uh, first we want you to show us that you can actually train police officers and change their behavior in the field. You know, there, there are very, very few randomized trials on training. It's a very important area. We, <laughs> there's a lot of money spent on training. We actually don't know whether it works in the sense of whether it changes behavior in the field. So Arnold said, we want you to show first. And so we began in Tucson uh, and looked at that question of uh, can the training uh, uh, change police behavior in the field? And it did in, a, in, a, in an important way. And you'll see the results in a minute across the street sites. Uh, there was not significant differences between them. Uh, but, and, and we were able to go on. So we began in Tucson, we then moved to Cambridge where Anthony Braga and, and Brian Turchin were located for the second study, uh, the second city, and it says site two, but it's the third city, uh, was Houston, Tex Houston, Texas. Now, uh, in each city, we identified 40 hotspots of crime, which were randomly assigned within statistical blocks to a procedural justice group and a, uh, uh, or the treatment group, and the standard condition group, or the control group. Now, Larry already mentioned the issue of blocking, which began in criminology, or at least in policing, with uh, the study Larry and I did in Minneapolis. Uh, but you'll see it has a, a, a tremendous, a, a really great effect on creating equivalence. Uh, in this case, again, we did it by crime levels. Uh, each, the, the unit of analysis was the street segment with both intersections. We also created a one-block buffer uh, to reduce possible contamination in, in the study. Uh, the crime criterion, and crime was the major issue, we wanted to identify hotspots of crime, was the top 2% of violent drug and property crime in Tucson and Houston, and the top 8% uh, in Cambridge. Cambridge is a bit smaller city, we had to change the criterion a little, but these are uh, uh, still the streets with, with much of the crime problem. Uh, there had to be evidence of crime in at least six out of the 12 months in the selection year. Uh, that was because we didn't want to identify a site that was only hot for a month or two. Sometimes there are cities where, like in Minneapolis, where in the summer you have certain streets near the lakes that are busy but not busy uh, when it's quite cold out. Uh, there also must be, there, uh, in order to be included in the experiment, we needed at least 15 residential units. Uh, why was that? Because we wanted to assess community sentiment. Uh, we, needed, we, we, we decided we needed at least seven uh, surveys. We would uh, uh, set as a goal seven surveys per hotspot. Uh, and we needed to start with 15 to have the prospect of getting seven. But you can see the data collection here is very difficult because we not only had to define hotspots, go out and look at them and make sure they fit the criteria that we were trying to do, we also had to, uh, to measure the number of residences, et cetera. Now, we've talked a lot about procedural justice today. Uh, some people have called this, I believe, the, the four principles uh, behind Tyler's work. Uh, but I want to state them just to, so we're on the same wavelength of, in terms of what we're talking about. One is participation, uh, giving citizens voice and being an active listener. When you come up to a citizen, uh, 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 before I think uh, Chief Murray came up and uh, 
talked a little bit about that, but you come up to a citizen and you say, uh, I want to hear your side of the story. So you're giving the citizen voice and you're listening to them. You're paying attention. Neutrality, uh, being uh, transparent and avoiding personal biases. When you go out to the field, you say, there's a reason why I'm on this street. There are a lot of problems here. Kids are being shot at. We need to do something. To make it clear that you're not just going to the street because of some particular bias or orientation. Um, obviously, importantly, dignity and respect. Uh, in democratic policing, we want our citizens, they're, they're the people hiring the police, we want the police to treat individuals with dignity and respect. And finally, trustworthy motives. Uh, you want to show citizens that you care, that, that, that not only you're coming here for a specific reason, but you'd really like to see things get better. So what's the treatment? Officers were assigned to the hotspots for nine months. Why nine months? Because we were trying to find a compromise between driving police agencies crazy, because randomized experiments are difficult for police agencies to enact, and something that would go long enough that we could expect it to have impacts. So we decided, for uh, qualitative reasons, I guess, that nine months was reasonable. That was, in some of the departments, the most we could get out of them in terms of being uh, consistent with experimental protocols. Now, when we, we asked in each city, there were four to six officers uh, um, assigned to each group, so in other words, eight to 12 officers, um, and we didn't tell the police who to give us for the experiment. We said that we want people with enough experience. Uh, we don't want people without experience going to these hotspots. New York City did that and ended up with a constitutional problem in the US. We wanted people with some experience. We didn't want people that had so much experience they weren't really working. Uh, besides that, we wanted people that you would normally send to deal with high crime streets. And they gave them to us. And then what we did to add rigor to the experiment was we matched those police officers in each city in pairs, and we randomly allocated them one person from a pair to the procedural justice or treatment group and one person to the standard condition group. So you have randomization both to the hotspots and the officers. Now, when we dealt with this, this standard uh, hotspots policing condition, what we could think of as a control group, uh, these were four to six officers focusing extra time and activity in the 20 assigned hotspots using traditional police strategies in each city. We didn't tell them what to do. We said, we want you to go there. We want you to try to reduce crime. Use the tools that you generally use in your city. So that's the existing condition. That's consistent, for example, in medical experiments. We use the existing protocols, and you compare the new protocol uh, to the existing protocol. Now, the procedural justice group, same amount of dosage, if you like, in terms of policing, four to six officers focusing extra time and activity on the 20 assigned hotspots. But here, there's supposed to be an explicit uh, focus on increasing trust, on using uh, procedural justice. Uh, these officers, by the way, as I'll say in a minute, again, got a four, I'll tell you a little bit about it, got a 40-hour training. I'm sure that's, that's a lot of training, at least in the U.S. or in Israel, 40 hours for, for a group of officers. Uh, that's very intensive. Uh, generally, procedural just training will be a few hours uh, uh, in, in departments. Uh, and they were told also to reduce crime, by the way, but they were told to reduce crime and build trust and legitimacy. So let me tell you a little bit about the training. Uh, if you, the details, uh, obviously in this talk, I'm not going to give you all the details. There was five days of training. Uh, on that website at the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, you could link in to all of these materials uh, that will give you a better sense of, of uh, if you want a, a more careful sense of what we did. Um, so as already um, uh, mentioned, we began, uh, we, we had an idea of doing a 40-hour training, something really intensive that would have an impact. We brought together a group of advisors, including Tom Tyler, uh, uh, trainers from police agencies, uh, even uh, someone from, I believe, the College of Policing uh, uh, came out to us in the US. We brought them together and said, how would you do this if you really wanted a group of officers who were going to be dealing with hotspots, that they would deal with them in a way that focused on procedural justice? Uh, and what was recommended, it was interesting to us, was that not just telling them about things, but also have scenarios, discussions, and opportunity to practice would be an important part of this, and that's what we did. So day one of this training, uh, they learned about hotspots policing. We told them about uh, the law of crime concentration. Most crime in a city, 
in, in most of the cities we looked at, and I was glad to see another city in Australia, about 5% of the streets produce 50% of the crime, 1% of the streets produce 25% of the crime. We told them about the hotspots experiments and studies. We talked about legitimacy and procedural justice and experimental protocols, why experiments are important in the first day of training. And the second day, we, we went in-depth to procedural justice with modules on the four elements that I've already discussed. Uh, and we talked to them about the historical context, often in the city they're in, of why it's so important to build uh, trust in policing uh, or trust in the police. Uh, the third day, we did role playing. Remember, the group we brought in said it's very important not just to lecture them. You need to, to get them involved and also to get out there with it. So we did role playing uh, to practice procedural justice. Uh, we also talked about nonverbal communication uh, and showing empathy, for example. Uh, the day four of the training was on using procedural justice with diverse populations. As you know, and I'm sure here is also the case, American cities face a, a, a great deal of, of uh, challenge in terms of dealing with minority populations, those change city to city to some degree. In some of the cities we looked at, Hispanics were the largest minority population, and other uh, blacks were the largest minority population. But even more specifically, we tried to bring knowledge about the context of the uh, of people who live in the city and, and how dealing with diverse populations is important. We also talked a, a bit about uh, behavioral health problems, uh, mental health problems and policing, which is becoming in the US uh, a major issue. And we also reviewed, though, just for a bit, implicit bias. Finally, in day five, that was a day when we went and said, how is this going to be supervised? We worked with the supervisors and the officers. We went over project forms because we collected a lot of data. Police don't like to fill out forms, uh, but we tried to make it as positive as possible. Uh, and we took them out and they practiced with us in the field in terms of what they wanted to do. So this is, by all standards, a really intensive uh, training. Now what about the experiment? Remember I mentioned we block randomized. Well, the first question is, did we end up with groups that were equal? The reason why this is important, why block randomization is important, is because just by chance you can get groups that are very unequal. Right? And that can be a problem uh, in the results of experiment that you'll get. It can make it harder to achieve, for example, significant, fi significant findings. So uh, it's very important. Block randomization helps you to create equivalent groups. Now, if you look at the left of your screen, you can see the total crime incidents per hotspot, by the way, uh, for the procedural justice and the standard condition group. And they're pretty much exactly the same. Now, when we look at calls to service, there's a bit more of a difference. Uh, but it's still not statistically significant, and partially due to the fact that uh, calls for service are what I would call noisy in statistical terms. Uh, they fluctuate quite a lot, even at the hotspots. Now, another question was, okay, the, the streets in the control group and the streets in the treatment group are equivalent in terms of crime, which is the key issue for us in the hotspots policing program. But what about in terms of the officers were assigned? Now, these are not large samples, but we are, were able to look at uh, at the two groups and see whether they were similar. Uh, we had a little, we, we were a, a little bit concerned here, and I'll mention something I didn't mention before actually. The, con the, the control group or the standard condition also got training. Uh, uh, they got a half day training. Why did we do that? For two reasons. Number one, we didn't want a placebo effect of training. They, we didn't want either group to know who was an experimental group and who was the, who was the control group. Uh, maybe if they talked a lot, one had more hours, but we didn't tell them that. We had training for both groups. And the training for the control group was uh, hotspots policing, experimental protocols, uh, and those sorts of things that applied to them. Nothing about procedural justice, trust, and those sorts of issues. Now, we also didn't want to prime the officers to, uh, 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 by, uh, in a survey uh, at the beginning of the study. So what we did was we asked just a small group of questions that related to uh, uh, procedural justice, trust, and legitimacy uh, of both the, uh, the standard condition group and the procedural justice group. And as you can see here, uh, we, we seem to have achieved what we wanted to do by the randomization of the officers. If you look at officers shouldn't take time to listen to citizens complain about their problems, virtually the same, uh, the treatment control group before the study began. It is important to give everyone a good reason why we are stopping them, even if there is no legal requirement to do so. Uh, the idea of uh, showing neutrality 
Uh, again, no significant difference and not much of a difference. Officers should at all times treat people they encounter with dignity and respect. Uh, by the way, exactly the same uh, level of response in both groups, which is interesting, a p-value of one. You don't generally see a p-value of one. They're exactly the same. Uh, but, uh, but it also shows that in these cities, there's actually that they understand they're supposed to do that because it's actually pretty high on these measures. And finally, police have enough trust in the public for them to work together effectively. Again, are virtually the same. So the hotspots, the randomization produced, the block randomization produced pretty much the same levels of crime. The, uh, the paired randomization, the officers, produced pretty much uh, the same uh, attitudes towards procedural justice and legitimacy at the beginning of the study. Now I should note for the officers that received the training, we also did a, a post-training uh, um, uh, assessment of whether they gained knowledge about procedural justice and legitimacy, and we found significant differences between uh, before and afterwards. In other words, after the training, by the way, that's consistent with a bunch of studies, some done by Tom Tyler and others, that if you train people, then you ask them afterwards about these concepts, they actually got them. Now, whether they'll put them in practice in the field, we don't know, and indeed, I think our study is one of the first studies, or indeed, maybe the first study to really show that. Okay, another methodological issue I was concerned about at the outset, Larry did notice, note my uh, pension for methodological concerns. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, uh, quite important to uh, uh, showing rigor in a study, but uh, I was very concerned with the study, well, how much dosage would our officers actually have in, in these places? And why am I concerned? These are hot spots of crime. There are police going by there all the time. There are people responding to calls uh, often. So uh, in this situation, there's a lot of policing at these places that has nothing to do with our experiment. And I really wanted to know whether, we, uh, whether the dosage of our treatment uh, was, uh, was enough that we'd expect to see an impact. I was especially concerned because if we didn't show, we did show an impact, but if we didn't show an impact, people would say, well, you didn't have a dosage. In other words, the experimental officers, it's just a drop in the basket of what's going on. And as you can see, and the departments are very helpful here with their management information systems, this was not simple to do. Uh, but overall, about 50%, and indeed in Houston, 60% of the time of police in these hotspots comes from our experimental offices, which is robust, which says that they can have an, they can have an impact. Uh, for the control sites, the results are uh, fairly similar. Now, one more methodological comment, just so you can understand what I'm about to show you. Uh, we use lots of different scales and measures, and uh, what statisticians like to do is create some uh, standard that we can use to compare them. Uh, a common standard is, is something called Cones D, uh, developed by Jacob Cohn, who was a professor at NYU and passed away a few years ago. Uh, but I want to note something about it, because often people show Cones D, and what the hell does that mean, 0 0.20, 0 0.50, whatever it is. And I also want to note that psychologists in developing this, Jacob Cohn in particular, he, he was using lab experiments, not field experiments. And uh, effects in field experiments, Anthony Bragg and I have written about this, are a different uh, animal, so to speak. Uh, 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 what the psychologists think of a small effect can be a large effect when you're talking about changing uh, uh, crime in a city or even in hot spots. But anyway, so here's the comparison I'd like to give you. So a Cones D of 0.20 is generally seen as sort of the standard that we do have an effect that's meaningful. Uh, uh, but I, I converted it to percentages to give you a, a sense of what's going on. So uh, in the mid-range, a difference of 50% in, in, let's say, the treatment group and 40% in the control group on some outcome, uh, that would be a, a Cones D of 0.20. Uh, but it's, that's a 20% decline, which is quite substantial in, in our world, I think. Uh, Cones D of 0.50, uh, uh, that would be a percentage difference of 65% versus 40. Let's say 65% response in the treatment group and 40% in the control group, and that's a 40 almost a 40% decline. So this would give you a, uh, a sense of what the, in Hebrew we'd say, clay mida, of what the, uh, uh, of how you should think about these effect sizes. Okay, the first problem is, did the training, indeed remember I told you that, that we were under the hatchet with Arnold, we had to show this first before we could continue the experiment in the three sites. Did the, chain, did the uh, experiment or the training, did it change the behavior uh, of the officers? And to do this, we used systematic social observations. We were very fortunate to have uh, uh, Steve Mastrovsky and Tal John, uh, Jonathan Zamir to help us 
in carrying this, this pro part of the project out. They're experts in this area. Uh, we trained uh, observers. A lot of training went to this. This was very expensive, I should note, as a data collection approach. We varied these. Uh, uh, they went out with the officers. They went out for an entire shift, one observer, one officer, entire shift. Uh, we varied that between officers uh, that, uh, that the observers rode with, uh, the days of the week that were observed. We did 400 hours, or they did 400 hours of systematic social observations, uh, and that led to 506 police citizen encounters that were observed. And what did they observe? So here's the question. Did the training change the behavior of officers? Well, the blue bar is the procedural justice group. The, uh, uh, the orange bar is the uh, standard condition uh, group. And you can see we had, it seemed to have had very robust effects. For a voice, uh, the Cones D is almost 0.40, uh, uh, a highly significant result. For neutrality, uh, Cones D is over 0.20, again statistically significant. Uh, for respect, about 27, and again statistically significant. And for trustworthy motives, in the right direction, uh, but a small effect size of about 0.16, and not, not statistically significant. Uh, so, and I should note that, and I'm not going to go through this, that we use we didn't just uh, use comparison of the bars. We adjusted for clustering and uh, other regression issues, but I'm not going to go into the details now, but just to know at the bottom of the slides, you'll generally see that if you're interested. But anyway, so it looks like we had an impact. The training affected the way they behaved the in the field, and the, the effects were, were important. And by the way, when we add this together into an overall procedural justice scale, look at the difference. I mean, you get a, a, a Cones D of almost 0.40, a highly significant result at the 0.001 level. So the training not only led to them talking the procedural justice talk after the training, but led to actual change in behavior in the field. Now, this is a, a really, in my view, gigantic uh, finding because we have very little we have very few randomized trials in training. And here we have evidence that you can, because a lot of people would say who are police scholars, you can't change the police because they're just, you know, they're entrenched by experience and other issues. And this suggests you can. Now, uh, in our measure of procedural justice, we use measures of respect. We didn't use a, a measure of disrespect. That's separated out here. You can see the effect size here, though, though to be frank, Disrespect is not a common occurrence between the police and the citizens. There was much, much more likely to be disrespect in the control group, in the standard condition group, than the procedural justice group with a Cones D value of uh, uh, over 0.50. Well, did the, well, it changed their behavior, their interactions with citizens. Well, did it change law enforcement behavior? Because one of the issues here that you might want to see happen is that behaving in procedural just ways will lead to less miscommunications between the police and the public and will lead to a situation where arrests, for example, would decline. And that's exactly what we found uh, using a, a modeling approach in which we compared the, uh, the arrest behavior of officers before the experiment and during the experiment comparing the procedural justice and standard condition, the result we get is a 60% decline in arrests. That's, that's, that's really uh, extremely large uh, uh, here. And you can see in the, just the numbers, uh, here you have in the experiment, there were 312 arrests in the treatment group in the three cities, and the, and the procedural, uh, excuse me, in the standard condition group in the three cities, and only uh, 98 arrests in the uh, uh, procedural justice group. So this is, it seems to me, also a major result of the study that not only do you get them behaving in procedurally just ways, you get them, uh, their activities lead to fewer law enforcement uh, uh, events. And by the way, as you know, every law enforcement event is expensive. If you can solve something without an arrest, that is a hell of a lot cheaper for the system. Because not only does it take more time for the police officer when there's arrest, but it goes through the entire criminal justice system quite often. And that takes uh, money and effort by the system overall. OK. so. We did change the behavior of officers. I think that's great news. If that was the only news, I would have been happy. My personal view is that procedural justice principles are the principles you want to see in democratic policing, sort of Peel principles. He wasn't around now, but I think he might have thought this way. And I always tell Tom Tyler, don't try to sell procedural justice on the issue that's going to stop crime 
or it's going to lead to changes in community sentiment, you should sell it on the idea this is how the police should behave. And here we have evidence that we can get the police to behave this way, or at least to behave this way uh, to a greater degree than they would without training. But now the question was, did it impact community sentiment? Uh, and what we did here was we did a community survey before and after the experiment. Again, a, a major data collection in three separate cities. Uh, we tried to get about at least seven surveys in each street, and we pretty much uh, succeeded in the three cities. The one city where we had many fewer uh, surveys in the second wave was in Houston. We had 109 surveys, uh, and the reason for that was COVID. It was conducted in COVID, and I'll tell you, data collection during COVID, have other people experience this, was a whole new ball game and a very difficult one. Okay, uh, well, the first question is, did it affect attitudes of people living in these streets about procedural justice? Did it affect attitude towards legitimacy? And uh, the answer is no. Uh, and these are, these are small effects, as you can see, the Cones D's are uh, uh, between 12, and, and in the case of procedural justice, uh, uh, point away. In other words, even though the police were treating people on the block more procedurally just, people who lived on the block did not really notice that. The theory would be that if you treat people on the block in a procedurally just way, either directly or vicariously, other people will learn about it, their families, their friends, etc. That doesn't seem to happen. And in terms of legitimacy, it goes one direction, the other direction. We asked them about legitimacy on the block, and legitimacy citywide, and uh, we don't see very much. And I'm about to show you another result that makes me think the reason we don't see much is because asking citizens about legitimacy the way we traditionally ask is kind of complicated. Do you, do you think the police are honest? Do you trust the police? I don't know. I started thinking about it. How would I answer that? Those are kind of like way fuzzy academic questions. But if you ask people something different, something direct about their experience, in other words, the police harass or mistreat people on my block, and here we get a really large difference between the standard condition group and the procedural justice group. The standard condition group is much like, more likely to be seen by citizens as harassing people on their block. And you can see between the first and second wave, indeed, in the procedural justice group, there's a lowering, of, a, 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 a very large lowering of that, an increase during. So that might imply, by the way, the traditional hotspots policing may lead to some concerns like that when people see a lot of police. But in any event, in the experiment, big difference. Our trained officers, the citizens are much, likely to see, much less likely to see them as harassing or mistreating people on the block. And what about police use too much force by block? Now, as you know, as police officers, police don't use force that all that often. So uh, there's a smaller numbers on this in some sense when people are thinking about it, at least from the citizen's perspective, I suspect. But in any event, again, in this case, a Cones D of about 0.34, Again, the treatment group is significantly less, is, is likely to be seen by citizens, and, and the result is significant, as less likely to use too much force. So uh, give some thought to that idea about the way we measure legitimacy, because there was a lot of talk about that today. I think that it's, that's a complicated measure. But when you ask people about something specific, are the police harassing people in the block? Are they using too much violence? The, the training led to a situation in which citizens were much less likely to see that. Now, finally, we have crime. Now, I have to tell you again, if, if I knew that I could train police officers to behave in the ways I want them to behave, in more procedurally just ways, and if that led to fewer law enforcement activities, and that led to people in the community seeing the police as less harassing and less violent. I just want to make one more comment on this. What is the major issue in policing that I see in the U.S. today? It's about harassment and violence of police. It, it, it's, it's not about a sort of broader view. It's that the police are harassing us, they're using violence. So the two most important indicators I can think about policing, we have an effect on. But now the question becomes, and if that was enough, then I would say, great, this is, you know, we, we, we have a lot of good news, if you like, for what the police can be doing. But now what about crime? So we compared a six-month period before to a nine-month period during the experiment. Uh, we ran a model, uh, and that model is reflected by the incidence ratio rate, which is easy to interpret. I'll show you. Uh, it's 0.859. Uh, one would be zero. So it means that there was a 14% decline in crime 
in the treatment group, in the procedural justice group. Now, I want you to think for a minute what I told you earlier. Anthony Bragg and I, in developing new estimates of the effect of hotspots policing, found that on average there was about a 16% decline in crime when you, uh, in the groups that were the hotspot group. It, you, it led to a 16% a decline in crime. Now, if you add 14% to that, because we're assuming that the two groups, that the control group is also reducing crime in that way, you're getting a 30% reduction in crime relatively, or that's what you would predict if you infuse uh, hotspots policing with procedural justice policing. And I think that's gigantic, actually. Oh, I should note, in terms of calls to the police, I told you before, calls are very noisy, they fluctuate a lot. Uh, you also have a decline in the experiment, about 9%, but it's not statistically significant. Okay, so what do we conclude? So, the first major conclusion is we can train officers to behave in more procedurally just way to crime hotspots. I think this is an incredibly important conclusion because there are a lot of people out there, many police scholars, who continually I hear them say, you can't change the police. They have these mechanisms from the street they deal with. It's all about craft and uh, what they've learned from their trainers, etc. Uh, that's, that's not true here. You can provide training to the police that changes behavior on a very important set of issues uh, which are hard for police sometimes. Uh, and I think that the result is quite important. In the context of a randomized trial, uh, as I've noted, there are very few randomized trials in policing. The National Academy of Sciences, at least in two reports, has said there, there are few, hardly any, randomized trials of policing that has to change, uh, in, in police training, excuse me. And I think it's one thing to think about here, that police training is a, a critical issue we have to be addressing. Now, such training also leads to fewer law enforcement activities. We measure that by arrest. That's also a, a very important finding because arrests are extremely uh, expensive. If you can reduce arrests by 60% at these places, you're gonna save the system a lot of money. You're also gonna save people that would have been arrested a lot of pain and suffering, right? So uh, I think that's an, also a very important finding from the study. We also found that infusing hotspots policing with procedural justice could lead to positive evaluations in the community. I think the two things people are concerned about, harassment and violence, our experiment led to strong reductions in the perceptions. We don't know the actual rates of those, but the perceptions the community has about those, and that seems to me the key issues at the moment. We did not find effects on legitimacy. Uh, we don't know why. Maybe you need a longer period of time. Uh, Dan Nagan and Cody Tellup argue that attitudes towards uh, legitimacy are developed historically. Uh, maybe there are other reasons. I actually think the explanation might be more, uh, much simpler. Uh, uh, Frank Cullen has raised, raised this in a recent article, that these issues of honesty, trust, et cetera, are very abstract and may be hard for citizens to really capture them on the intake. Uh, infusing hotspots policing with procedural justice uh, can increase the crime prevention benefits of hotspots policing. One way to think about this, I, 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 working with Larry early on, he, I, I noticed he liked to do these sorts of things, Larry. You would say that if I get 16% out of hotspots policing, an additional 14%, I've doubled the crime prevention, right? Isn't that, that's what La I learned from Larry, I'd say. You double the crime prevention benefits of uh, hotspots policing. Well, that also, it seems to me, is very important. So what is the argument here? Remember, at the beginning I said that the, at least in the U.S., the what I'm hearing is a sort of an either or. We can either focus on reform or we can focus on safety. Well, this study suggests that you can focus on safety and reform at the same time. That these are not competing ideas, but indeed can be reinforcing ideas. And anyway, we thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, and I'm going to invite questions, um, which I would ask that you hold until I can get to you with the microphone. And I'm hoping people on the aisles will ask lots of questions. Okay. Uh, hello, Professor David. Uh, congratulations on astonishing work here. I'm Dusan from Pol uh, Serbian Police. So I have uh, questions regarding procedural justice because I think it's really important. 
uh, who did it? Uh, is it some team of professionals? Because obviously there were a lot of fields covered like mental health, hotspot, policing, and justice itself. And uh, how did you manage to avoid uh, that placebo effect you, you mentioned before? Okay, so who did the training and how was the placebo effect avoided? Yeah, the, the training was done by uh, Cody Tellep uh, and uh, uh, other people, Heather Vovac and other people at the foundation, uh, with help from trainers in the department. In other words, they were part of the team that, that uh, worked in the training. Um, uh, we found more generally that uh, there are certain academics that can do this and certain academics that can't. Yeah. And uh, uh, our experience with Cody has been great uh, in this regard. He's done this multiple times. So uh, I, I think we tried to maximize the effect of the training by involving the police trainers in the departments we were working with. So that gave some legitimacy to what we're doing. But obviously we, we, we had an impact, and I think Cody deserves a lot of credit here in particular. <laughs> the, um, oh, the issue of the placebo effect, you know, uh, uh, it, we tried throughout this experiment to blind everything. The problem in the real world is the real world has vision. Um, so we didn't tell the observers which were the treatment hotspots and which were the uh, control hotspots. When the uh, observers rode with officers, they didn't know which hotspots were treatment and which hotspots were control. The procedural justice group did not know they were a procedural justice group. The standard condition group did not know. In other words, we didn't tell them. And uh, I guess the, one of the reasons we, we gave a half-day training and made a big deal about it for the standard condition group was so they would feel special as well. So we tried to avoid the placebo effect to some degree in that way. We also were very reinforcing to all of the officers about how important they were, procedural justice, by the way, <laughs> showing them respect, dignity, explaining values, et cetera. We, we tried to reinforce for them how important they were in this process. I think we succeeded uh, in the departments. The fact that, that the effects you observe here are pretty much consistent across the uh, departments, uh, I should note with the exception of arrest, of which there were many few arrests in Cambridge overall, though there's still more in the treatment group, but uh, overall, the effects are pretty standard across the departments, which would imply that that, that probably was the case uh, uh, in terms of minimizing those sorts of effects. There's no way to get rid of them altogether because people can, in the end, figure out something. How many days of training did you have? We tried to reduce that sort of, those sorts of issues. Okay, and could you say where you're from, sir? Yes, of course. Uh, my name is Peter Doyle. I'm from Brunel University, London. Um, thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Um, I think you've partly answered my question, to be fair, but I was wondering how much tolerance you built into the study compared, uh, what I'm trying to say is, the officer's behavior may have been uh, affected by the very fact that they were being observed. Yeah, well, th these questions, by the way, are not so much about our study, but about field experiments more generally, about how you can try to reduce some of these problems. The, uh, the, the general evidence is, and uh, 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 the mentor of both myself and Larry Sherman was, Al Reese from Yale University. And, and he started the approach of systematic social observations. And his observation was that p police after a, a it's, it's, it, you can change your behavior for an hour or two, but changing your behavior over six or seven hours continually is very hard for observers. I would say that, you know, uh, w would it be likely that someone would put their, their foot on someone's neck and kill them while they're being observed? Probably not, although in the heat of the moment, there's this evidence in economics that, uh, that once people go into the mode of the heat of the moment, they, those things get blocked out and they do what is natural for them. But, but I think in general, the evidence is that, that you do observe uh, 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 what police would typically do. And the fact, by the way, that we find significant differences and large differences between treatment and control suggest that. There was a difference in how they behaved. And Professor John McDonald of the University of Pennsylvania. David, uh, really fascinating work. I was wondering uh, how uh, we can get the word out more. Um, I didn't see a lot of pickup of this in the New York Times and other major media. It seems to me that this should be receiving a lot of attention in the current policy discussions about policing. Well, you know, I, I have that question as well, actually. The, the article did get picked up. It's on the websites of major media, but they didn't write specific stories. Uh, there were some uh, media outlets that did pick it up in the U.S. Uh, Haaretz in Israel, which is a major outlet, picking it up. The, um, uh, but it was surprising. I was surprised the New York Times, Washington Post didn't pick it up. I, I think part of it, to be frank, 
is that, uh, especially in the more liberal media outlets, uh, they don't want to hear good news about the police at the moment. That, that's a difficult thing to say in a way, but, but I think it's true, a number of people have said this to me. If, if this study had shown the opposite results, if it was a study that showed strong racial biases and other things, uh, it, would have been, it, it would have been picked up. At the moment, that's not the narrative that people want to hear. Uh, that's okay. I think we do our work. I don't do my work for what's happening tomorrow. Uh, we, by the way, we shouldn't say oh, there's a, a, a web meter that, that talks about how impactful your work is. And, and this was like uh, uh, five times higher than the average uh, article ever published, or 50. I don't know. It was pretty high overall. So it's not that it's not getting picked up. Uh, but I think our work, it's, it's, it's a long haul. That's the way I view my work. You do rigorous work, sometimes rigorous work can be hard because all that methodological detail can make people kind of snow over and close their eyes. But, but it's that sort of work that has the long-term impacts. I'm not looking to get into New York Times tomorrow. I think it's important for policing, but that's not my goal right now. Uh, I think it's important we affect how the police are behaving in the field, things that you, this is an important uh, uh, venue for me. Uh, and I think that in the long run, it will have impact, little by little. Uh, sometimes things take a bit of time, but there is, yeah, I think you, you, you and I have had a conversation about this, right? I think we, right now it's hard for these media outlets to say anything that's sort of good news about the police. Like, why would we care? This is like good news of the police, we, where the focus now is on uh, uh, exposing the more problematic elements of policing. And but, a question, sorry, did you finish? Well, I was just going to say, if someone else has ideas about that, I'd love to hear it, but that's, yeah. yeah. We'll see. Ask me this question another six months, John. Okay. It only came out a month ago. We have a question from Simon Rose, who's an alumnus uh, both of the Cambridge program and of the Metropolitan Police Service. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, fa very grateful, fascinating talk. My question was around your comment around Cohen's D uh, and it being you know, created in a lab experiment and your, your view that potentially uh, a smaller effects or a different scale of effect sizes might be more applicable for field experiments. Um, have you any thoughts as to what that scale might look like or anything you could share with us on those, in that area? Yeah, Mark Lipsy, uh, you know, I don't want to take credit for this concern because Mark Lipsy raised it a number of years ago. Uh, he suggests that in crime experiments, he was talking about delinquency, uh, Cohn's D should be seen as a small effect, not 0.20. What Cohn says is he's saying 0.20 is about an effect that we, is meaningful. And that's something you pay attention to, right? Uh, it depends how we do it. The problem is small, moderate, and large has their own interpretations. Uh, I, think in, I, I think that Lips and Mark is right. I think effects of 0.20 are robust. Effects of 0.50 in the work we do are strong. Anthony Braga and I tried to, uh, it, it turns out that using Cones D for uh, uh, effect sizes in uh, hot spots in place-based crime analysis uh, is not a good idea for a variety of reasons I won't go into right now, methodological reasons. But, but when we went back and looked, uh, Cones D was underestimating the effects by about half, we found. And then we translated those effects to crime. Let me just give you one more example. There was a study, Anthony Braga was telling me about a study done that was published in a major outlet that, uh, that found that a focused deterrence, I believe, reduced like 20 murders or something. And the writers of the study said, well, it seems, you know, that's not a very large effect, huh. right? Because 20, <laughs> from a statistician's point of view, 20 is not a large number. And, and so he and I looked at each other, 20 murders? I mean, <laughs> 20 murders, if you, uh, Rand calculates that, I don't know, it would be like 80 million or 100 million dollars or something of cost savings if you could prevent that. So there's a lot of misinterpretation. That's why I decided to use, I, I, it sounds like I might have been effective in using those percentages to give you a sense of, of what it meant. Yeah, you have to be careful. Quite often, uh, statisticians and others develop something in one context, apply it to another, and sort of the language does not get changed. Could you please identify yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Sarah Kelson Brown, Devon and Cornwall Police. Um, I, I was just thinking that when you look at those four pillars of procedural justice, would you agree that most people um, not involved in policing would find it absolutely mind boggling that those aren't the central tenants that should go with training? Uh, that seems just fundamental to policing. Thank you. Yeah, I, look, uh, Tom Tyler would certainly agree with you, absolutely. The, uh, I think, when, and actually Tom and I have had a, a group of discussions about this. He's, uh, though my experiment now is supporting him more than any other experiment, if you like, that, that I know of, but, but, but he wants to hang the hat of procedural justice on, um, 
on effectiveness, for example. And, and my own view is if not effective, it's still that's the way the police ought to be behaving. It's just it's pretty straightforward, right? Yeah, I think that's a wonderful insight that Tom Tyler had. By the way, almost all police agencies I know teach this insight, and your agency is right. In training today in the academy, this, is, this comes up. And maybe that it doesn't come up with the intensity that we're talking about in our experiment, but it is being, I think police have, have gotten the news that this is very, very important. The question is what happens afterwards. The next question is from Heather Strang at the University of Cambridge. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, David. Um, David, I just want to go back to this training issue because it's absolutely fundamental, isn't it? It's the underpinning of the whole experiment. The quality of the training uh, is what determines uh, these results. Um, and Cody, of course, is, a, is terrific at this stuff, and there, and there are other people scattered around who can do it well. But we if this is going to make a big uh, change, it's got to be a, a program of training in, in procedural justice that um, can be picked up around the world and an acknowledgement that 40 hours is what it takes. It, half a day gets you nowhere and just interpolating it into normal police training as probably happens uh, certainly in this country uh, in, in a minor way is not sufficient. This has to have far, far more prominence. Um, have you, uh, as part of uh, what you've published, have you actually documented exactly what happened in the training in a way that it could be replicated elsewhere? Yeah, th we, there's a lot of documentation, and uh, the full training, all the videos, all the outlines, all the, the whole training is completely available to people. But I've actually said to the Police Foundation that they ought to capitalize on this and develop a training they can bring to departments throughout the U.S. at least, in, in terms of moving forward. Um, the issue of the amount of training, with most, look, uh, it's, it's a difficult time in policing, I think, in many ways. Uh, police uh, are having trouble hiring. They've lost a lot of officers. Uh, time has become a, a large issue. Uh, I think that uh, five days of training, most police departments start with, well, that's, that's a great, like we've tried, I've tried to get some uh, people interested in increase in five-day trainings. I'm curious, what would happen if you train the entire force this way, right? I think it's an interesting question, an important question, right? And it's, it, five days of training is very hard. I have one force in, in New York State that might be interested. Uh, it's, it's a lot for people, I think. Now, one of the questions is, do we really need five days? Maybe we need two days. So I have a randomized trial that was supposed to start next month in Arizona, in Phoenix, and, and that's falling apart for all the problems in policing as well, which is too bad, because we were going to do a two-day training there uh, for policing hotspots, and I was curious as to whether that would have the same sort of impacts that we see here. But anyway, you're absolutely right. The question you should ask is, why are there not more rigorous studies of police training? Why are there so few rigorous studies of police training? Like, I don't get it. Like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more, a little more the kind of egghead, egghead academic, I guess, but I, I just don't get it. It seems to me like the, the government should really be concerned. They're spending a fortune on it. How much money does your agency spend on training? How much money does the British police, a lot, I, I suspect. Uh, the college of, where is Rachel? Rachel Tuffman back there. Rachel, right? I mean, this is training. We need to, there are not many rigorous studies of training. I think it works both ways. Many academics have not been interested in, in training. And the other side, uh, for whatever reason, people just assume training works or something, and they're not interested in uh, assessing us. And, and this MST program, the work you're doing, can have a big impact. Because uh, these are people, many academics are, are not interested Many academic, uh, police scholars are not interested in policing, in my view. They're interested in this aspect of policing in, in the universities, it's interested to them. They're not interested in what, I, what Peter and I have talked about in evidence-based policing, of the vast array of issues in policing that have to be addressed in terms of training. And maybe you guys are the people that will make that happen. Well, we have the senior training official for all of Britain uh, in policing, uh, Andy Marsh, to ask you another question. Th thank you very much, and congratulations on the well-deserved award and uh, the compelling evidence that you've just offered, uh, which I certainly will be checking against our curriculums at many levels. So look, two quick questions. What, one is on methodology. How do you choose uh, on the areas that you ask 
um, the public about whether to ask positive or negative questions. I'm interested. There's a stark difference in some of the questions. Uh, and the second uh, question is, is there any evidence on the, the legacy, the lasting impact of the training? Uh, because that's such an important thing as well. Yeah, I think that uh, we, we did not create any real innovation in uh, the survey work we did. We went to surveys that were already extant and drawing from the general rule in surveys is to both have, you know, direct, go both ways in the directions of questions because people get, you know, people start answering all on the right or all on the left. You have to be careful you don't confuse them, of course. So uh, in terms of the methods, I don't think our study has much to add. In terms of the impact, it's interesting, we decided it was important to debrief each department. So we organized a uh, event in each of the departments. It was on Zoom, a lot of this occurred during Corona, uh, in which we told them about the study. Uh, it's hard to tell in the different departments. It's, uh, it's actually quite interesting. In Cambridge, there's a long history of interest in procedural justice and <coughs> innovation in policing. And in Cambridge, when we came, the chief was like, the previous chief did start the experiment, I saw the end, we're gonna keep going with this. It was, it was great. Uh, in uh, in uh, uh, Tucson, uh, we had much less feedback. We, we're still trying to uh, arrange our meeting with them. The chief changed, the, you know what happens in policing. You get a new commissioner, a new police, especially in the US, we don't have the sort of national system. Uh, things change a lot. So I, what I'd say is some, in, some, in some cases, at least we have examples, of where there was long impact of the experiment. In Cambridge, they're gonna start using this more training, they're, they're, they're doubling down. The other departments uh, in uh, uh, Tucson last, in Indianapolis, which we didn't fully carry out the experiment, interesting enough, they're interested in uh, the results, what the results said, and doubling down. So it's hard to tell. But, but you know, my, uh, you know, I guess it's a, a problem, not a problem, but of academics or scientists. I look at my job as producing the evidence. I'm a little less involved quite often in seeing that evidence uh, get out there. Another, like John asked a different question but in a similar vein. Well, it's certainly a question for Rachel Tuffin, and you asked her one yourself. So anyway, here, let's hear from Rachel. Thank you, yeah. Um, terrific to, to hear you talk about it, David. I'd, I'd, I'd read it in advance and found it very compelling, of course. A um, Couple of things, so one was just to say about, so we are evaluating um, training now. We've done a couple of randomized control trials and we're trying to do more, and if anybody's doing anything inside their own force, that they'd like to work with us on, we'd be um, absolutely delighted to co collaborate with you, so um, please get in touch. But also, I, my, my question was gonna be, and you've already answered it, about dosage. But I wondered whether we could also get to the key ingredients bit, which is kind of related, isn't it? It's like in, in everything that was done there, maybe there were like three things that were the absolutely critical points to, to land to really get the result. It's a really interesting question, isn't it? And so you and I were going to follow up anyway on, on Zoom uh, to do that and have that conversation about dosage and key ingredients would be fantastic because it would really help us to work out, do we, like Heather said, should we be doing this almost as deliberately standalone or can we incorporate some of it into the core curriculums? Yeah. You know, I want to say that you know, the UK is in a better position than the US to actually advance in this, these ideas of policing in part because of the College of Policing. Uh, national training and other issues, because you can focus in on training and try to make it happen. The US really, in this case, the diffusion uh, doesn't work. I should note, Rachel, that we're finishing up a book for Cambridge University Press in my Elements series, in which Cody's the first author, in which it's all about the training. For those people interested in training, uh, write me at some point and I'll let you know when, when this book comes out, which has a lot more detail. Our last question is from a uh, graduate of the MST program who is currently a PhD student. Uh, running various randomized trials in the Metropolitan Police. Ben Linton. Thanks, Larry. David, I was, I was very interested in the reductions in arrests, and I wonder if you can tell us a bit more about the types of crimes that were not being arrested for, and was it because of a change in behavior around, for instance, stop and search, or if there's any sort of more detail you have us, uh, about that. And I was also interested if you experienced any um, resistance to the training. We tried some procedural justice training in the Met Police in London um, and we've had to pause it after a couple of sessions because many of the officers reacted quite strongly against it and felt that it was sort of patronising and uh, I'm sure we could learn from others who've done it but we thought we were doing it well and I don't know if that's because people in the Met are just incredibly resistant to it in that way or, or, or whether that was replicated but you were able to overcome it by, by carrying on over the course of a week rather than just say a, a day. 
Yeah, uh, remember that the officers who are in our study are volunteers, right? The, the, uh, because of union issues, you can't just assign people, right? So uh, the, the officers are volunteers, so both for treatment and control, you have people who had volunteered. By the way, let me put this clearly. They didn't know they were going to learn about procedural justice, right? So they're volunteers to participate in a, a study, if you like, or in a... Uh, something which perhaps means they're more open. I don't know. Um, we don't have the volunteer effect in the sense it's not the treatment group is volunteer and the control group isn't. They're both volunteers. Uh, we didn't observe that. I mean, I don't know, maybe it was the five days and the chance, like the officers could complain and say, well, that doesn't make sense to me, and then we'd go back, and then they'd ask a question, and we'd, we'd go back to the, the uh, uh, people at the academy and say, well, you told them this, how does it, you know what I'm saying? There was an interaction that made it perhaps more legitimate for them. They also knew in every department that uh, our training was vetted and supported and sometimes uh, trainers were involved from the department. And uh, my impression was the police had a lot of respect for the trainers. Do you know what I'm saying? In other words, they, uh, uh, they saw the training done in their department as actually a pretty good thing. So we didn't, experience, we didn't experience that sort of problem. I'm going to invite Peter Nehru and uh, Alex Murray uh, to uh, come to the uh, uh, continuation of this discussion in a way that gives David a little rest. Uh, our, please welcome our chair of this discussion, the uh, former uh, uh, chief constable of the National Policing Improvement Agency in Thames Valley Police, and uh, as of October 1st, the director of the MST program in Applied Criminology and Police Management uh, at the University of Cambridge. Peter. Thank you, Larry. Um, and actually, it's quite nice. We're actually, f we're actually in a cold room to consider this with our brains functioning. Um, David alluded to, to, it a couple, to it a couple of times, um, and this is not an advert, uh, but we've spent quite a lot of time, David and I, over the last period of time. We're starting off with the Harvard sessions on public safety which ironically took place in Cambridge, uh, one of the three trial sites, uh, with American police chiefs talking about the crisis before the crisis, um, out of which the pair of us wrote a paper on police science, a new paradigm, which we've just rewritten in the light of development since. And central to that piece was actually applying evidence-based policing and science to all aspects of, of policing. Um, and it's, it's part of a conversation that you know, the, the three of us have had over the last, uh, the last period of time. Um, the one thing, the first question, uh, that, or, the, or the first issue I just wanted the three of us to debate in front of you is, if first, is, is that enough evidence to move forward? Uh, because we usually say to each other, that we need more than one trial, although it happen, as it happens, we've got more than one trial of procedural justice. We have several trials of procedural justice training. There's, there's, there are a few, David, they're not perfect, but they do tend to point in this. In fact, you've done another one in Seattle, if my memory serves me right. Um, they, they do point in a broadly similar direction, although this certainly is more systematic. So is this enough to start, or do we need to find uh, three sites? I mean, Cambridge being an obvious one in the UK, um, as in Cambridge Mass and Cambridge UK, because they are both university towns, there might be some similarities. Another one in London, another one in Birmingham, or I, I, th I don't know if there's a comparator to Tucson, but certainly three sites, multi-site study in, do we need to do that before we proceed, or we, can we work on a, a working hypothesis, picking up what Heather was saying about you know, how much, how well do we know, how can we replicate that particular training approach, which I think is a, you know, is an interesting conundrum for the, for the college. So Alex, do you want to start me off on that? So is that enough? You're going to West Mercia as a, as a, a new deputy. Is this something you're going to take with you? Yeah, it's enough for me, uh, for sure. So uh, if you put yourself in a position of any leadership, most of you are in leadership in policing, you see that presentation, you understand the theory of procedural justice, you know what officers do and what they don't do. I was interested to hear what Ben said. You know, there's the suck eggs problem, right? Which is, um, you say to officers, I want you to listen to them, treat them with dignity and respect, demonstrate your motivation is good. The three tenets of procedural justice and everyone sort of goes, duh, thank you for patronizing me. But then you pick up Lorraine Mazarol's experiment uh, from Queensland, you pick up other experiments and you see again and again that it's profoundly different. You know, you have 
Lorraine Mazarol's checklist, rather than blowing that, please, for your positive breath test on your way, it's, uh, you know, the hardest part of my job is telling someone that they've just lost someone in a car accident. Um, and we don't do it. Um, and the PJ makes us do it. So, um, yeah, it's certainly something I've taken away, and I have already, it's already on Twitter, uh, whilst listening to you, and I've sent it far and wide, because I, I think it, it's, it's enough, and it's strong enough, but for replication, right? So let's, I don't know if you've seen um, Mark Rowley's announcements around what he wants to do in London to build trust and to fight crime. I mean, it's virtually your, the title of your, your piece uh, there, David, so it's enough. So if it's enough, um, what we just saw there was what I would describe, to, to use a, uh, a UK television advert, that wasn't just uh, food, that was Marks and Spencer's food, <laughs> in that it wasn't just a hotspot study. Uh, we also got a hotspot study with procedural justice, with an embedded example of doing training systematically and applying it in the, in the, in the face of the... In the, in, the, in, the, in the face of the hotspots to, to achieve and to look at not just the behaviour of officers but the response and the reaction. And you've got two things that are really significant that, in, that, that are going on here. Not only are you getting what you would expect and a little bit more from the hotspot study, so you're getting the reductions in crime, but you're also getting something that I think in the context of the debates about policing in the UK and the US uh, in particular, is highly significant, and I'm glad somebody asked the question about it, which was a reduction in the use of arrest. And how do we think about that as a, a product of this uh, particular? How do, significant do we think that could be? Well, it's beautifully controversial, isn't it? Uh, and I, so I really enjoy that finding because still across the country and probably across the world, the management information we collect on success often is based on arrests, amount of arrests. The more, the better. Yeah. Uh, yet we also see through Turning Point that's coming in a bit, Katie Harbour's work in London uh, and the work in Birmingham, that when you divert people from the criminal justice system, you divert them from a criminogenic effect, i.e. they commit less crime in the future. That's an uneasy thing for us as police officers to understand or accept. Um, and I, I thought it was a, an incisive question because uh, if it was less arrests for public order, great. If it was less arrests for possession of an offensive weapon, perhaps not so great. Um, you know, have you been really nice to them to the point that you get on very well and you don't search their trousers for a machete? You know, the the reduction in arrest is mostly from sort of lower level arrest, right? The things that you might arrest someone or might not, not for the more serious. D David, could I ask that in American language? Uh, are these contempt of cops arrests that they're not making if they have the PJ training? Uh, that we can't tell because they don't list on the arrest form contempt of cop. But, but I think that they're, they're the kind of arrests that are made when you get pissed at, you know, when, when things get out of hand and it fits the theory. They're not, uh, no one's going to not make an arrest in a situation that involves uh, domestic abuse or thing, you know, other situations that, that the, the, the arrests must be made. So, yeah, we, we just looked at this recently, actually, because we had the same question. I think it was you who asked that, right? So, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're, Alex, you're right. Yeah. The other American name is aggravated popo, which stands for pissing off a police officer. So let's just follow this, this track through. Um, we've, we've, we've got one study, and, but it's a strong study, and I think David very carefully laid out the fact that it's, got, it's building on the shoulders of a series of, of studies. So you've got a, actually more than 60 studies on hotspots, uh, but the 60 that, were, that David, David had a, uh, reviewed with Anthony Braga are showing a pretty consistent effect, 16% reduction. I don't think there's many of us in this room who've been in charge of large policing entities that would, not, that would turn down the opportunity for a 16% reduction in crime. Sorry, can I hear that voice? No. Okay, so you're going to buy that, you're going to buy that piece, but we also recognise... That, and there were some hints in the study as well, that doing hotspots, hotspots, and we've obviously got the major rollout that's been taking place in the UK, and we know uh, from, the, from that rollout, because quite a number of people in this room are involved in that and have been reviewing uh, the, the, the rollout of the, of, of the, uh, the, of the programme in violence hotspots, that, sus that, get, that being consistent and sustaining it is quite hard. And we've also heard from David that 
the investment in training is, uh, is, a, is, is challenging, but actually, uh, Alex, um, we are in the UK training a huge number of police officers through the Police Constable Degree Apprenticeship and the, and the, and the initial programmes through the Police Educational Qualification Framework. I'm glad I was able to say that at this, at this juncture of the day. Um, that, but actually, that's an opportunity. It could be a an, an relatively easy adjustment to import a working element of evidence-based into, into that. And many of the universities that are represented here delivering that program could probably draw on that and achieve it. So you said you'd, you'd take it in West Mercia as you, as you arrive in September. Uh, how? Thanks. Well, if I can make a couple of points before that, but the... I mean, so there's Sarah Bennett and I think it's Kirsty from Queensland Police. They're not presenting today, but they've just done a huge piece of work, an RCT on a week's training for sexual offence courses. And it, they were talking to me last night and it blew my mind about the effects, that, the effect sizes and what they were seeing as far as outcomes. And, it, you know, we have moved away from being generalist police officers. And this is, uh, the point is, when you specialise... What is a specialisation? Um, you become a sex offence officer, you go on the course that Queensland offered because it makes profound difference for attrition rates for victims of rape, for example. But what about if you are at the forefront of tackling violence, which is my area, doing stop and search in real difficult communities? Clearly, that is a specialism in both thief-taking but in treating people with dignity and respect at the same time. And you need to invest in that specialism and treat it as a specialism because it is really difficult because nobody likes you. It's very high threat, but it's also very high violence. Um, and it, the work that you're doing really fits in the bit about am I un over policed and underprotected? Well, this sort of provides an answer to that where you are, are both protected and policed at the same time. So... Um, to your question, Peter, what, what do we do? Um, so, uh, I'll tell you what we don't do. We don't cloak it for our officers in highfalutin language and academia. Um, we make it understandable um, and we take the core tenants and, uh, and we do a replication and I pick an area and I involve staff when we must involve staff. This cannot be an idea of the Deputy Chief Constable. Um, it can't be the idea of a senior leader, but, and Peter, you do this very well, where you get a, a team of eager staff together and say, how can we do this together? How can we build trust whilst taking weapons off the street? Um, what are we going to do? Look at this, um, and let's build a program that's similar, and we're going to test it again, and then we elevate those individuals as, you know, change makers, people who drive innovation, not about me, it's about them, and they take responsibility for it, and I, I think... I think that's the approach we should take. We've got a study here that's been conducted in three cities. Uh, so for those that don't know the cities, they're, they're variously... Well, Houston's a very large city, one of the largest cities in, in America. Tucson, medium-sized city. Cambridge, Massachusetts, effectively a city next to a city um, in the sense that it's, it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's, the big, it's the smaller neighbour of the, of the bigger Boston. Uh, which happens actually to be doing quite well in the um, homicide data in the in the in the U.S. Oh, that's a comparative compared to the rest of the world, but Boston's certainly at the bottom of a of a of a league of shame. Um, but they're all cities, and Alex is about to go to West Mercia. I was uh, I held the same post as you did actually. I was the deputy. Um, uh, you are going to need to acquire the ABC book of tractors. Um, <laughs> because it's, it's, it's got a lot of rural and not so many cities. Can we just think about, because that won't, that won't just be a problem for, for, for you in your next role, but it's actually an issue that it kind of get, gets regularly raised. Um, I'm looking at Michelle. You've done hotspot studies in Bedfordshire. There's two bits of Bedfordshire. There's the, well, there's one bit which is a bit more urban. I nearly said not so nice, but that's a bit pejorative. And there's another bit which is a bit more leafy. To be fair, yep. And the one bit has got well, things that look like violence hotspots, and the other bit has got things that actually might look like, look like places with a bit of vulnerability to burglary or a bit of vulnerability, but, but they're not quite so hot. They might be warm or there might be clusters of things, and they might have a longer-term perspective. But there's a different way of looking at rurality, which 
and, and, and geographic disparity, which make, sometimes make these studies feel less relevant to chiefs. And I'm looking at David Cowan. I mean, in Australia, you've got, you've got huge areas of not very much. Um, kangaroos can be a problem, but, uh, but you know what I mean. You've got a large, small, small locations. So just, just think me through how you're going to arrive in a, in a, in a force which has got five, uh, five big urban centres, six if you count, count one, another one, but six big urban centres, a lot of rural, and you're going to be taking this particular piece of learning. Just have a think. I love the sort of inverse snobbery that exists within policing um, about uh, who polices what area. Uh, if, if I could count on one hand the amount of times people have said tractors to me. Um, the <coughs> said it You've said it four times already, yeah. Um, so we have this thing, don't we? Well, firstly, let's value... Uh, everybody and every community equally and not have a hierarchy of need oh you are you know you suffer rural crime it doesn't matter um you suffer urban crime it doesn't matter you know it's all important to us as human beings and individuals um but there is this thing called external and internal validity and jeff uh, later is going to talk about hotspots in london and uh can i can i steal the thunder jeff Go ahead. okay but a very, very well-delivered trial, as far as dosage is concerned, no 16% reduction in crime. So, no, I, I did try and take that, and I didn't get the answer. I didn't get what I wanted. So the internal and external validity is important. What works in one place doesn't always work in another place, and they might even be towns. London is a unique city, and there might be something different around hotspot policing in this city. And those areas in West Mercia, both rural and urban, may be different elsewhere, which is why... You know, when Peter and Larry conceptualized the triple T of targeting, testing, tracking, and today's session, by the way, was meant to be about how we can be precise about violence, but anyway, the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, how, how do we target in all of those areas, you know, the Pareto curve, whether it's the cops, the spaces, the people who are causing most harm, um, and then how do we test to see whether our existing assumptions or evidence is effective? And we can go proper gold standard RCT, or we can go down the scale. But as long as we're thinking, does, does, is this having an effect? Without forgetting the important T, which is the tracking, which is what our officers, what are our officers really doing? And that's why it's really interesting listening to Dave Cowan earlier, who turned, so when you're in your hotspot, turn on your body worn video. Um, that's a really interesting thing because, um, so, so my approach would be, um, let's look at what are you doing at the moment what does the evidence say is effective what's the gap let's fill the gap and if you want to do something innovative let's test it but first uh, we're coming i need to go into an area and go um okay so what's the capability and understanding of evidence-based practice in an area because you can't just suddenly download it and the answer is not probably me uh, directing what happens it's me as a capability builder in the organization and then allowing people to flourish and target test and track in those areas um, I mean, I, I do think with evidence-based policing per se, you know, there's a lot about police reform at the moment, and there are literally thousands of institutions out there trying to reform policing. Uh, I think the most powerful institution that reforms policing is the police itself, and we are part of that, and evidence-based practice is right at the core of police reform um, by doing things like this. Um, and in fact, we're probably the most valuable asset we have uh, as far as driving police reform by using evidence around things like procedural justice. Um, so yes, we're in the storm at the moment. Yes, we need to feel un uncomfortable and we need to push for that. Um, but I suggest that we are the people who should do that and should be driving it. I'll get to Vance in just a sec. So don't worry, it's on my, it's on my notes. Um, but I just wanted to bring Larry in. So the, the, this, this kind of goes back to John McDonald's question about getting messages across. So, 1989, um, the article that, uh, that you, you were an author of that identified the, the concentration. Um, 1995, uh, the Sherman and Weisberg hotspot study, um, and any student of this course has heard that one at some, at some depth and had a look at it and, and turned it over. Um, we move on, we've got uh, we've got about, well, at least 80 studies. 
we've we've got colleagues who've replicated the concentration in India. It's been replicated in a whole range of different countries. We've done similar work with uh, folk from Hong Kong. It it's you know you've got robust principles now that are should be you know clearly understood across virtually anybody who's doing anything in policing. What are your reflections now that you know we're starting to put trials together here which are bringing together different aspects of what we think are vital to delivering good policing and very much in line with the uh, the title you set for this conference and the kind of Goldilocks policing that you uh, set out in a couple of recent pieces. What are your reflections on John's point about how we gradually get this message out in the turmoil of uh, simple answers and slogans. I mean, defund is, is a slogan without substance. Um, and quite often, and this is a more complicated tale, we've just heard it, it, take, it took 50 minutes for David to carefully set it out and you know, quite, a lot, quite a lot of questions to begin to understand it. What are your reflections about the next steps, about how that builds into the profession and how the profession that assists and supports and develops the research can help take it forward? Well, I think it's no accident that this meeting is happening here and, uh, to the best of my knowledge, not in the United States. There wouldn't be a comparable meeting to discuss this experiment um, with... At, at, sorry, I, I should have noted, with the exception of George Mason University, which has its own annual conference uh, on uh, similar matters and is very well attended and very influential, um, but um, uh, I think one of the claims I can make is that you have more of the senior people in British policing here than any meeting in America can uh, hold, uh, uh, than any university is likely to attract in the United States. And it's not a comment about the universities, it's a comment about the police profession in the United States, which I think has far less curiosity uh, about the um, implications of this massively growing knowledge, as I said last night, uh, in which the gap between what is known in the research literature on policing and what is known by officers on the street or police chiefs of um, famously in the U.S. 18,000 police forces, most of which are under 20 officers. Um, the, the, the challenge, I think, is different in different countries. And um, what I'm very grateful for is the extent to which the British police have been consuming the research produced in the United States. And we have to recognize that if the United States hadn't invested uh, in the U.S. Department of Justice funding uh, led um, very remarkably by James K. Stewart, Jr., a police captain uh, in uh, Oakland, California, who for um, almost eight years, I guess more like six, was uh, director of the National Institute of Justice, uh, James Q. Wilson encouraged him to fund lots of police experiments, and that's really how evidence-based policing got started on the research side. Um, but uh, 20 years on from that, it was going nowhere on the policing side. Uh, and it was with people like Alex Murray uh, coming to Cambridge that um, we started to see the impact in Britain to the point now where uh, I think um, if, if by any metric, uh, including the recent survey done in the UK, on awareness of evidence-based policing, um, which um, uh, is indicating that at least people have heard of it, um, not, that's not the same thing as knowing what it is, uh, what it's not, uh, but at least there's the right words, uh, and you even got a candidate for prime minister who, as vaccines minister, talked about the incredible importance of getting research and data in front of the British people so that they could be more informed voters. And uh, in his first day as chancellor, declared that he wanted to be an evidence-based chancellor and get all the facts on the table. Um, facts are very much at peril in many parts of the world, not just Russia, uh, certainly uh, in uh, some of the uh, recent four-year period in the United States, facts were uh, not uh, well supported by the president. And what I think we're dealing with is a much larger cultural problem of how do facts fit into decisions that people make, not just with their governments and their votes for governments, but with their lives and their response to vaccine and mask 
uh, interventions that have been shown to reduce their chances of dying. And with their defiance of what is claimed to be facts for reasons that are emotional and political and cultural, um, people are literally dying to disagree with the facts. And that's, uh, that takes us back to the idea of resistance that Dave Cowan suggested, um, that we, we still have resistance, certainly in the UK, uh, a lot more in the US. Uh, but I, I couldn't be um, uh, honest if I didn't say I'm really astonished at how far evidence policing, evidence-based policing has come in the UK. Um, and to, to even think about that more generally when we have the uh, uh, details and the precision of the experiment that David Weisberg has told us about, it, what, what I, my, <clears throat> my immediate thought is not the macro but the micro, that wouldn't it be great if the next step, uh, especially if we had a British Arnold Foundation, uh, maybe we should get the Arnold Foundation interested in funding British experiments because uh, they'll get taken up right away in, in important uh, uh, consequence. What is it that we should do next um, to help move all of this along? I think it's to have the full Monty, which uh, to put it on the table, is control hotspots that aren't getting any uh, police presence at all and doing the kind of survey work and in indeed selecting them, because not all hotspots have residential households that you can survey, but that was a very important part of that design, I think, that I didn't quite fully recognize until this morning. So if you have hotspots with residences where you can survey people and get their perceptions, um, and you can even do perhaps studies of officers who uh, haven't volunteered for the study, so you can get some other dimensions about external validity as well as the internal validity of the experiment itself. If we can not just combine those two estimates that David talked about, the 16% and the 14% uh, reductions in crime, but actually have a control group without concentrated hotspots policing and look at the total dosage of policing, uh, as, as Jeff Barnes has been doing with Alex in, in London and, and their teams, um, I, I think that, that would take us even further to estimating what's the benefit of procedurally just police patrols in hotspots compared to very few patrols at all in hotspots or just sort of accidental, accidental reactive uh, policing uh, in these hotspots. But if you take it, you know, go back to the facts, the fact that 80% of most cities has, have no crime at all is not a fact that any politician uh, would recognize as everybody knows that. My grandmother could have told you that. No, your grandmother would tell you the crime is everywhere and you should be afraid, be very afraid because crime can strike anywhere, anytime. And, and that's what actually a lot of academics wrote uh, well into the 1990s and, and into the early part of this century. Um, and to be able to promote the idea of uh, predictability uh, in time and place um, is, is a threatening idea. People say, oh, no, that's going to hurt property values or you'll scare people. You, people have a right to be safe everywhere, every time, uh, at all times, and, and we shouldn't be um, insulting them by telling them that they're actually going to be unsafe in certain places at certain times. Well, I think that's what we did with COVID. And for a while, we were saying some parts of Britain are a lot more dangerous than others. So I think that's where we've got to come back to this question of do we believe in the Enlightenment? Do we believe in talking about facts? Can we get the younger generation, if I may, of undergraduate students at this university who don't want unpleasant facts to be discussed um, because they cause discomfort? Um, can, can we figure out some way to have a dialogue, as Tony Bottoms and Justice Tankaby would say, a dialogue about having a dialogue around facts? And are we prepared? Do we give enough trigger warnings uh, as we talk about these things? These are all the larger issues. I think for the short run, uh, and, in, and in the long run, we're all dead. So in the short run, I think if we can just keep doing more experiments, but also training more people, based on the experiments and see this as a very long road down which people like Alex Murray have been leading the British police very 
quickly, far more quickly than I ever thought. People like Dave Cowan, uh, people like Simon Williams and, and Bruce O'Brien. Uh, I, I mean, I think this idea that uh, it's all going to happen in spurts and fits and starts. There's not going to be a steady progress by any means. But today, and that study in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, it's definitely a milestone, definitely a landmark that, that we can recognize. And uh, I think it's, it's great that um, we have held this many people in the audience to discuss it. Um, and uh, that's all I think I should say about it now and hand back to, to Peter and maybe Alex has his points from the slides uh, to make. It really relates, David, to what you said. So when I first came here in 2006, I was in the counter-terrorist unit and I, I did my analysis on legitimacy uh, in Muslim communities in Birmingham because it's really important when you're fighting terrorism because at that time terrorism was taking place in the name of Islam. Um, and I created hotspots for vulnerability to violent extremism and in those hotspots I tested which communities had legitimacy in the police or not. And I compared Muslim BMEH communities with non-Muslim BMEH communities. And, and what I found was that in the areas where there was most vulnerability to violent extremism, that's where Muslim communities had the least legitimacy in the police or the least confidence in the police. Um, so that's perhaps obvious. Um, but then we used, I used multiple regressions to look at a number of factors that predicted why those communities didn't have confidence in the police. Was it their age? Was it their ethnicity? Was it their religion? Was it their marital status? How long they'd lived in that area? Was it poverty? And the one thing that the data and the data science showed us more than anything else was whether that individual had had contact with the police in the last 12 months or not. So it was within our control and it was an inverse relationship, i.e. it was negative. Uh, the police contact had driven down confidence in the police. So where we needed most confidence in the police was where we had the least confidence in the police and the factor driving that was in our control it was police and you know if and i remember presenting it i think at the second international conference on evidence-based policing and david was in the audience uh, and he was you won't remember this david but an academic hero of mine and he asked me a question about stats that i didn't wasn't able to answer but it was like uh, by uh, uh, i felt very flattered that david weisberg was even going to answer me a question but it, it you know, if we're talking about precision, I was going to talk a bit about provision, precision and violence. We can't do that. But I do think, you know, we come to conferences like this, we learn about evidence-based policing and it challenges us and we need to learn about it as senior leaders. I do think the next phase of evidence-based policing is us as senior leaders understanding the concepts of data science. And it's a little bit difficult because none of us... Very few of us go through university and learn that. None of us come out of the College of Policing learning anything about data science. But if we are going to be precise about whatever we're going to tackle, we need to know the concepts of data science. You don't need to be a data scientist, but you need to know what you're talking about. And I suggest that everybody needs to know what an independent and a dependent variable is. I suggest everybody needs to know what a regression is and that they can ask our analysts and some of our own data scientists, who, are, by the way, uh, it's a lot easier to achieve now with online low-code and no-code platforms. That, that's the, the direction we should go in much more because it allows us to be much more precise in where we're focusing. Um, so I won't go through the slides, but here's a piece of work that Carmen did for me. So in the first COVID, a bit like Dave Cowan, let's visit a 1,000 violent offenders. Didn't have time to do it as a randomized control trial. Let's be precise in who we're visiting. Uh, and Carmen's just used the regression to show whether it had any effect or not, you know, years later. And it did have a statistically significant marginal effect, not very big, for young people associated with gangs, you know, compared to those people who didn't get a visit, slight reduction in crime. Similarly, a colleague of mine, Detective Chief Superintendent Lee Hill, again, trying to tackle violence, visit the people in London who in the last 12 months have stabbed someone and have been stabbed. That's quite high. So... Um, again, a bit like David, um, let's get a detective knocking on the door. Um, and we'll wait for some full results later. Uh, but it's looking quite promising. And then with hotspots, we've got, the, we've got this GPS uh, ability to track our officers in hotspots. And it made me think, and you're just now, Peter, around no crime areas and whether we, put, we have complete no policing areas. All our GPS is recorded 
in, in the UK. Um, and we have good data science. So there will be police places in London that have had no policing anyway. So there's already a, and, and you can apply some statistical tools to say, well, what's the effect of those? And we, we can measure that they've had no policing because there's been no GPS coordinates pinging in those areas. And we can compare them to similar areas of a similar crime type that have had GPS pings. Uh, and we can see differences. Um, so, uh, Again, we are a relatively broad church. You don't always have to RCT it. You can come to someone like Andreas, who's a data scientist, and you say, Look, let's work through some insight we can have here. Uh, and here's an example that Jeff's going to talk to later around how we are tracking the increase in GPS coverage in hotspot areas, but I won't spill his thunder. Again, using a regression, this is um, from Paul Dawson's work in Mopac in London, which areas are causing most serious youth violence? Uh, and he's used a regression, which is basically multiple little correlations, to say um, what are the sites that are causing us most trouble? And in actual fact, legal graffiti walls and skate parks. So, you know, those iconic sites within a certain location, that's perhaps where you want to get officers uh, engaged in procedural justice encounters in those areas. Um, and then I just thought, I'd end with, and what is not precision? Um, and uh, there's a really good organization called the Violence Reduction Unit in London, led really well, uh, and have just invested 10 million pounds in cognitive behavioral therapy that's being sent out to local authority areas. And we know CBT, for example, is really effective in tackling violence. Um, and what we need to do to make it more precise is not generally give it out, but make sure it's focused on those people who, have, who can have the greatest impact. And I think anything that's generally applied across the board is probably not precise. So just a couple of comments there, please. So just, just I can get him to sit down from time to time. I know it's difficult. Um, I wish Pippa well with that. Um, so come back, to, come back to the violence question. And a lot of the examples you put up there uh, were examples of you trying to refine your focus. Mm -hmm. So trying to work out the amount of, of, of patrol you're applying, whether you're applying patrol in areas where crimes are taking place, whether you're applying with a youth example, whether you're applying uh, focus or interventions in places where you've got the, the highest level of recorded, reported problems and concerns. And my, my kind of sense of building on um, David's research is a question that was posed by um, Charles Mansky and Daniel Nagin, which was, can we, can we work out an optimal level of policing based on a combination of two things, one of which is the scale of the problem that is perceived, reported, recorded, cons and uh, people are concerned about, on the one hand, and the level of the intrusion of the intervention that police are putting in place. Now, it seems to me, having listened to David's presentation today, that actually that dichotomy might not be the right one to reflect on. That, that in fact, regardless of whether you're, you're talking about highly intensive places or relatively low intensive places, and whether you're tackling the most serious violence or somewhat, somewhat less serious violence, there, are, there is a set of standards here about procedurally just approaches to whatever intervention you're putting in place in place, which seems to me to be both vital for democratic policing but also it would appear effective in getting you the double effect of reduction. Does that, is that how, for me, that's one of the takeaways of the, of the morning. Yeah, I, I, I think you're bang on. And um, how do, but the procedural justice is quite obvious, isn't it? And, the, the, and I think it was another question to you earlier, David, which was how, or I think Ben, you raised it, the, how do you get officers to see this as something different to business as usual? Because we know that it's not applied as business as usual. But every police encounter should have the PJ approach entwined in it. And do you know what? It probably in all leadership conversations and in all our internal conversations, internal legitimacy predicts external legitimacy. If I treat my staff terribly, they'll go out and treat the community terribly, I think is the phrase. Real quick point. Of the four principles of procedural justice, the, the one that consistently is not delivered in the Cambridge studies of body-worn video camera footage is trustworthy motives. 
in David's experiment, the one uh, of the four that didn't take from the procedural justice training was trustworthy motives. Dennis O'Connor was on a street in Brixton with a constable who was asked by a young man of color, are you here to oppress us? And the constable said, I'm here to stop people like you from getting murdered. And that turned out to be just the right thing to say to have a conversation. He was conveying a trustworthy motive, which no matter how much we try to tell officers to explain the benefit, just as the QSET, uh, the dr uh, drunk driving testing in um, Queensland that Lorraine Maserol and Sarah Bennett and colleagues tested, to talk about why are we making you take these breath tests. We're making you take these breath, just breath tests to keep you alive. We care about your dying. It seems to be very hard culturally for police to say, we care for you, we're here to help you. Uh, or perhaps there's too much cynicism that if we say we're here to help you, people say, yeah, go on. But the question, I suppose, to be more precise about this is, how do we persuade people to give their trustworthy motives? How do we p boost the value of procedural justice, potentially, by getting that, that statement of we are here not because we enjoy pushing people around, but because we want to make you safe. And you must have some ideas about that. Yeah, I, uh, so some of my officers two, three weeks ago, Brixton High Street, uh, hot day, in the afternoon, three people with balaclavas and gloves on stopped them. Um, they ran off, they caught one of them, one of them, um, had a knife. They caught another one, uh, took her balaclava off, and it turned out to be an 11-year-old girl. Um, Brixton High Street, very volatile crowd. What do you do? Very upset young child. Um, they stop and search her with a very angry crowd. Um, and carving knife found in her trousers, an 11-year-old girl. The body-worn video of the female officer had a huge impact on me. She was there face to face with this little girl. You know, you, you're vulnerable. I'm here to protect you. We need to work this through. Um, to your point, Larry, then I want to get that clip <laughs> and I want to show it to everybody because it's not management. It's just a beautiful illustration of uh, an officer in a very heated environment demonstrating that their motivation is good um, and doing the right thing as well. And so how do we take body, snatches a body-worn video like that and say, this is what we all need you to get to? Uh, the stop and search still needs to take place because an you know, 11-year-old is clearly being taken advantage of by elder children and it could be subject to either being hurt or hurting someone herself. Um, yeah, I, so, I, so I think it's sort of taking that and industrializing it, but um, making it real as well. We often get posed the question when we're talking about evidence-based policing about a, a false dichotomy between the craft and the science of policing. And the example that, that um, Alex just gave puts it, and, and together with David's presentation, puts it nicely. Particularly in this case where we're talking about the professionalism of street policing, what the, what the science we've heard today has allowed us to do is to better understand the parts of the craft which need to be accentuated and develop in order to deliver the results. There's not a dichotomy here. We need officers when we're recruiting with an understand, with, a, with professional, professional understanding, personal empathy and skills, but also with the knowledge to understand the, bit, the, the, the behaviors that they do, the impacts it has, and the way in which those impacts and their commitment can produce the outcomes we all devoutly desire from our officers.